Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Forward Thinking Podcast. It's Chrissy and Charlie here from CS2. We just came off a short hiatus for the summer, but we're back with our first interview since then with Kirti Dewan. She's the VP of marketing at Bug Snag, who recently got acquired by Smart Bear. And for full transparency, she's one of our clients. And we we thought it'd be great to have Kirti on to discuss you know, being a leader. So Kirti's been a VP of marketing for almost nearly a decade now. Um, and we thought it would be interesting to get insight to everyone about her transition into leadership. Uh, she has a very interesting background and also talk about hiring because we do get a lot of questions from leaders around hiring, building out their marketing teams and how you do that while also creating an environment that isn't, you know, cause, causing burnout or stress for the team. And uh, so Kirti is a really good example of that. So welcome Kirti. Thanks for being on. Oh, thank you. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me and uh, super excited. And I'm happy that I'm the first one after your uh, summer trip. So uh, hopefully everyone is refreshed and this will be a good chat. Yeah, great. Well, I think to start, we wanted to um, set the stage with some background into your career path, because I think it has, you know, it's not as linear, I think, as some people would think with also, um, you know, part of that being um, a break, which you'll talk about um, outside of in-house. But um, can you give us a little bit of a background on yourself, how you got into uh, you know, startup world and um, your path in between to becoming a VP of marketing? Yeah, so um, I've been at Bugsnag for three years now. Um, when I joined Bugsnag uh, in August of 2018, I was the interim VP of marketing. And uh, at that point, I had been consulting for about two years. And um, while I was consulting, I had done a bunch of projects with large companies as well as startups. And uh, the plan was not to necessarily move into a full-time role, but you know, just keep exploring other consulting opportunities as they come along and Bugsnag being one of them. And it so happens that I transitioned to going back to in-house uh, within a couple of months of being at Bugsnag, I realized that it was a pretty special and unique place. The culture uh, was is fabulous, and uh, it was you know it was it was so it was so special that it just made working there uh, very different. And that was the reason that then I moved over to uh, being the full time VP of uh, marketing at Bugsnag. Before consulting, I had been at three startups. And before that, I was a big company person and had been at several other um, big companies. Um, while I was at, the last big company I was at was VMware. And while I was there, I just started getting this itch that if I've been living in Silicon Valley for so long, would I, regret one day that I didn't try out the startup scene, right? We live here, this is what we live and breathe. There's just so many people around us who are startups, a good combination of startups and public companies and big companies as well. But one of the things that I was dying to do was to just try it out. And I said, hey, if it doesn't work for me, I can come back to this. But how can I be living in a place like this and not know what that side of the world looks like? And so um, I just decided that the time was then. I wanted to go into the startup, I wanted to go into startup land. Um, it wasn't that easy. Um, you know, most, most recruiters and most companies, and especially startups, when they have to hire folks, they are always one of the factors that they consider is the size of company that you are coming from. Mm -hmm. And I didn't fully understand it then because I used to always wonder as to why do they think that my VMware and the other big companies that I've been at, why is that such an important factor for them? It's nearly becoming a, you know, it's a, det it's a deterrent. And so why is that the case? I know that I can do this. And if only they would believe me that I can, I can do this. But it's only after you switch over and someone gives you that chance and you go into uh, that first startup 
and you see how things are so different where you are you know, everyone knows what you are doing you are truly responsible and in charge of everything and when that happened um it, it started becoming more of a reality for me as to why startups had that about how they hire mm -hmm. people or where they don't from big companies and the funny thing is that as i've been hiring and building out our own team at Bugsland, <laughs> that's a factor that automatically just comes up when you're trying to evaluate for someone's aptitude and attitude as well mm -hmm. right and how how much ownership will they have and how much responsibility will they be able to take and how much can they how much can they run with it mm -hmm. yeah um, i think it's like a sink or swim kind of thing but it sounds like you were able to swim like you've been in startup since then so i think they took a chance on you, but what, what were some of those like things that you had to learn quickly to do, or what were the biggest, like kind of shocks to you that you had to get over? Yeah. So, um, one is definitely, you know, that the, the team sizes are much smaller, mm -hmm. um, and the entire company size is much smaller. And so everyone knows everyone else and, uh, you know, them pretty well. And so when you are, um, when, when you are in a team setting, uh, sorry, when you are, let's say, in a collaborative setting, the way you work with one another is, is so important. Mm -hmm. And um, the nimbleness of a startup on the way how things can move forward, you know, everything that you hear about, that is totally true. Mm -hmm. But with that, you also realize that, wow, the work that I do, you know, it's going to be out there very quickly. Everyone can see it and everyone can get in and poke holes at it and you there's nothing personal you just have to go with the feedback and you have to take it in the in the you know vein that it was given so it's all given with good intent um so that was a big lesson in terms of the velocity at which things happen but also the way feedback is given and how you should be able to receive that feedback um that was a big learning and then the other one was that you are definitely the owner of the responsibility that has been given to you and how are you how are you going to make decisions how will you make those trade-offs and one of the things that my manager had said to me then the key thing here is how are you going to influence right and so how do you those traits become so much more important when you're in such a small team setting because there are no optics anymore like there could possibly be in a big company and so without all of that, how are you being yourself and how are you projecting your best foot forward? And at the same time, you got to work as a team. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd love to um, dive into, you know, one thing that's particularly interesting to us. And I think also our listeners, given that marketing ops people do often jump between like consulting and agency life and in-house like quite a lot. Um, and I, and before we started actually recording, we, we were talking about this a little bit. So I'd love for it to kind of revisit that conversation for our listeners around like what led you to consulting, um, and like what, what made you make that decision and how you found that going from, you know, big company to startup land. And now you're, you know, a consultant, like that's you know, another even bigger like <laughs> amount of responsibility or like different things you have to deal with. So love to double tap into that and talk about that um, transition. Yeah, so um, after my third startup, um, uh, by that time, my kids were had grown, but they were still little. Um, and my husband was traveling a lot. And so managing the family and the home and uh, my work, everything had fallen on me. And it was a lot. And things were just crazy. Um, and it was overwhelming on most days. And I just realized that there has to be a better solution. And my son was acting out and uh, it would, so, yeah, someone had to find a fix. And uh, yeah, in most cases, in many cases, the fix does come from the mom. And so here I went and I thought, well, let me try to go out on my own. Um, let me see how this will work out. And uh, it was a very tough transition to make mentally. I really had an identity crisis 
and I used to worry about who will I become and how will I relate to myself and what does this mean and will I ever be able to go back in the workforce again full time and what are the risks that I'm taking and uh, yes, I have to do this for the family. Then you feel guilty that you're not being a good mother because you're thinking about yourself or your children come first. And you know, will my kids remember this? Anyways, the list goes on and on yeah. and on. And um, I went into consulting thinking that this is a way for me to have one foot still in the door. Uh, I will not ex exit the workforce, but I'll still stay in. This way I'll be mentally stimulated. It makes me a better parent when I have that active brain cycles working the entire day. It makes me a better parent. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully things on the home front will improve that way as well. And within three weeks, I saw that sanity was returning and things were becoming more harmonious. So it was totally worth it. And so that's why I decided to stay on uh, for a little bit more. And, uh, you know, it was... It was, I have to say that I was quite fortunate during the entire process uh, because the gaps, one of the cons about consulting is that the gaps that you have between projects and there's a certain type of attitude and a certain type of person who is able to deal with those gaps because you don't know what's coming next and you wish it would come sooner, but it doesn't always come at the speed that at, at which you want. Um, and so dealing with that uh, as well was was quite hard, but when the work would come, you know, I would enjoy it a lot. And um, when I said that I was fortunate, it's because again, people took chances on me. There were people who didn't know who I am, you know, knew nothing about me. And when I met with them and uh, presented them with what I, I could offer, they were like, yeah, let, let's try this out. We, we have this for you. And again, you know, really grateful for the folks who opened doors during that time as well. So it's it's a combination of good luck, good fortune, it's hard and you really, you have to get very comfortable with uh, who you are and how you, how you define yourself. Yeah, that's so interesting because it sounds like there was, so you had so many worries that just all turned out to just be fine, it all turned out to be fine, right? So I'd, I'd love to know, if you could go back and speak to that person, but also or like speak to other people who are maybe in the same position and they're thinking, you know, I need to get more balance. Maybe this is this could be an option to me, but they have the same kind of anxiety that you had about kind of like the loss of identity. You know, is it going to work out? You know, you listed off so many things. And I think a lot of people feel that. You know, what, what would you tell them or what would you tell yourself if you could go back and speak to that person? Um one of the one of the greatest things that I landed up doing was actually going into consulting. I didn't realize back then the enormous value that it would bring to my life. It really put things in perspective, not just at a professional level, but also on a personal level. And the amount that I grew during those years, I think, has been really um, exponential in many ways because there was so much time to reflect. Um, one of the turning points that I had was when I was at one of the startups um, and there were you know, everyday issues going on. And uh, I came away from one of the things that we were working on realizing that I cannot let someone else's perception or definition of me say who I am. And I cannot live by that. And I have to turn that around and I have to live by my own definition. Uh, my definition of who I am. And I can't let someone else's perception come in the way of who I am going to be. And I think that was a big turning point for me. Um, and then from there, as I went into consulting, I always hung on to that thought. And during those two years, I was able to um, get more clarity to that thinking as well. So one of the things that I always say to my kids is that if you are on the freeway, and you start looking behind your shoulder all the time and you start looking right and left, what do you think is gonna happen? There's gonna be a crash and you can't do that. You just gotta stay in one lane and you gotta know who you are and you just, you just, you know, you hold steady to that, you stay true to that and you just keep going. Um, having that perspective on so many different things like this um, has been super helpful. Sorry, there's a little bug here. I don't know where it came from. Um, 
And um, you know, one, one of the other things that I realized is that um, you know, given where we live in Silicon Valley, there's just, there's just so much energy around us and it's there all the time. It's just all consuming. Mm-hmm. But I realize it's all consuming if you let it be all consuming and you don't, there's no need for FOMO. There's no need to do everything that everyone else is doing. You do what's right for you and you can still get to where you need to be. Mm-hmm. And so once you start, once you start looking at those external factors as noise and you start picking out the ingredients that are not noise to you, um, it just gives so much more focus and it brings a sense of calmness. And those were just, you know, breakthrough moments. Yeah, one of the things, yeah, I'm really glad you used the word calm because I was actually already, you know, prepping what I was going to say next. And I was going to use that word calm. But one of the things I've enjoyed about working with you is you do bring like a calm kind of like approach to your work, but not like in a, you know, like a, yeah, because I guess a lot of times in Silicon Valley, it's like you should just be like, burning yourself out like going crazy and that's how you become successful but you know you're proving that you can be successful and be calm and like mm-hmm. centered and focused you know and I think actually that's probably a better a better way to become successful and you probably become more successful doing that because you're not going to have these peaks and then like crashes mm-hmm. constantly but every time you burn out do you think you needed do you think you, you ever would have found that kind of like that that calmness that time to reflect if you had stayed in house did you need that kind of reset and that period to then like kind of find that in yourself do you think yeah um, such a great question uh sorry I cut you off Charlie what you yeah saying? no that's that was the question yeah just do, do you think uh, do you think you would have found it eventually in house or do you think you just never would have had the time to even think about it when you were just yeah. like going 100 miles now I've thought about so many times that would I have reached this level of um, stability? Oh, I'm cracking up a little bit because we say Bugsnag is an app stability management platform. (laughs) (laughs) Um, um, On brand. (laughs) um, On brand. Um, So I, I keep thinking about that myself that, you know, did I have to step away Mm -hmm. so that I could uh, step in with that level of stability and uh, calmness and Mm -hmm. more confidence, right? It's not that confidence wasn't there, but it's like just, or maybe I shouldn't say confidence, it's more control, Mm -hmm. right? And I think that uh, if I hadn't stepped away, I probably could not have stepped back in with yeah. this with this perspective and having so much clarity and just being able to um, always, you know, having an understanding of everything that's going on around you. Hey, let's take a step back. You know, now I use it for everything. When things are going crazy, guys, 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 let's take a step back, walk away from this, you know, come back to it tomorrow. It will still be here, but you'll be rejuvenated and you'll have a clearer mindset as well. So I think I did, I did need to. And if I hadn't, I don't know what would have happened. I probably would have got there at some point, but I think it would have taken so much longer, so much longer. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in a way, my identity crisis and everything that I was going through just turned out to be a blessing in disguise. I had no idea all the great things that would come out of consulting. For instance, my network grew enormously. Mm-hmm. And especially yeah. with vendors and agencies and contractors, Charlie, I wouldn't have found you otherwise, right? It, it's, it, it all comes from that network that I uh, managed to build in such a short period of time. And uh, even the great people, that I met and the different managers and leaders that I met. And then you see everyone's styles and you're able to say, okay, I'm going to borrow these. And, you know, these are probably not for me. So it was really accelerated learning on multiple fronts. Yeah. We talk about that a lot, actually accelerated learning when you work Um, kind of in, in it, we talk about it from a different perspective sometimes, but I totally agree with what you said. Like for us in marketing operations, when you, as a consultant, you're working with so many different companies on a lot of the similar type of problems, but from just different angles and in different environments. But then once you've done something in all of those different modes and all those different companies, 
you've just accelerated your learning as opposed to just like doing it once for one company in-house you know for mm-hmm. a year you know so like right. we definitely find that a lot it, the the learning you know pace just increases exponentially mm-hmm. um so what so I'd love to know when you you've got this kind of calmness and you you ended up kind of falling back in-house right because you went you were consulting for bug snag and then you mentioned that your job was to hire the VP of marketing, like to help them hire their VP of marketing. And then it ended up being you. Now you've been there for three years. How do you try and impart the wisdom that you learned during this period of consulting onto your team as a leader of the whole marketing team at Bugsnack? And like, because everyone's probably coming again from maybe that, maybe a lot of people who are coming to work for you were kind of similar to you prior to consulting, coming from another startup, super busy, super like crazy. And then they're coming to bug snack and you're t- obviously you're probably trying to create an environment that maybe isn't like the ones that, you know, you came from and try and create more of a calm atmosphere. Of course, we're still in startup land. So it's always going to be, you know, busy, I'm sure. But how do you try and create your own kind of philosophy and environment for your team? Now you've got, you know, now you're back into the in-house world. Um, so one of the biggest reasons that I, um, I I switched over to going back in house was, as I said, was the bug snag culture. So it's the bug snag culture that already had that steadiness to it mm-hmm. and that non hyper um, feeling to it, and it really had a um, it. it the importance that they gave to the balance of, you know, self and family comes first or whatever else you have going on, you know, that comes first, this is a job that does come from the bug snack culture. So there's a reason that I was attracted to it because it was in line with, uh, with the way I think and the beliefs that I have. Yeah, I guess you and probably so wouldn't have even worked there, right? Maybe right. you wouldn't have taken that job if it hadn't already aligned right. to those values. That's interesting. Yeah. Yes. I would not have um, because I knew I had got several offers while I was consulting to come back in house and I had you know, declined most of them. And mm-hmm. Bugsnag w- was the one that struck me as being different. And so I had to even ask myself, I was like, wow, I haven't had these thoughts come into my head for the last two years. And the fact that they are, it's a signal, it's saying something. And so it was the the fact that the bug snack culture aligned with me, you know, I gelled with that uh, was already, uh, it was super helpful, super helpful. And so the way the company has hired is is always along the lines of indexing very highly on cultural fit. Mm-hmm. And so you know, that it, it, it just, it just automatically happens, you know, it's such an intrinsic thing inside the company that um, everyone is, is just, you know, goes with it. Um, That's an important point, I think, for people to hear, because instead of, instead of trying to think, okay, I'm going to go to, and maybe you're in a company right now, and you're struggling with this stuff, and you're like, okay, I'm going to change companies, and I know maybe it's probably going to be the same there, but I, I'll try and change it. That might not be something that's going to be potentially something that you can change so maybe mm. you need to be super picky about choosing companies you know like you're saying that already align to those values right and I know companies yep. probably sometimes say that so it might be hard to judge yep. um but but still like really prioritizing that I think is important yep yep for sure absolutely right and most people that even interview with Bugs Tonight, they'll always say that culture is very important to them uh, and they're looking for certain things in the culture as well. And, you know, we'll align with those. And then uh, mm-hmm. those, those people end up being a good fit for us. So that's one part where the Bugsnag culture has been uh, paramount to helping make that decision and then transfer the same type of values to the team that is getting built. One of the things that I did early on at Bugsnag, um, and this was a great suggestion from our CEO, was to build a framework for characteristics or traits of high-performing marketing teams. Mm. And um, so I built that out um, because I used to have these discussions with him. It was always about, well, you know, how are you gonna grow this team? What do you want this team to look like? If just assume that you have all the budget in the world, what should it be? And um, as you can imagine, building teams is super duper hard and you have limited resources and budget in a startup, but you still have to get all this stuff done. And so it's constant, it's a constant you know, trade-off. 
um, and every day you're doing this give and take. Every hour, in fact, you're doing a give and take. Um, if I take this, I drop that, what should I do? Mm -hmm. And so I built out the framework and uh, I had four pillars in it. And then I had supporting bullet points that support each of those pillars. And I shared it out with the team and I was pleasantly surprised as to how well it was received. And um, when we were putting out our first job rec, um, again, this was about three years ago, one of the first people on my team said, you know, every job rec at Bugsnag always has the Bugsnag values at the end. But in the marketing job recs, we should start adding in the marketing values too, the ones from your slide. I was like, hey, so now, you know, it started showing up in all our um, mm -hmm. uh, job recs as well, which was great. And the team really rallied around them, which I didn't expect would happen so quickly, but it was, it was, it, it was that gel, you know, it mm -hmm. really helped mm -hmm. people come together. So I know we also wanted to talk about, um, we're running out of time here a bit, but I do want to ask you one one last question and we can always do a follow-up podcast to dive deeper into some things. And because you just mentioned building the teams, we wanted to get into like the first several hires of the team and, and what your philosophy is there. And you know, the second question is, when do you hire a marketing ops person for your team? I know there's mm -hmm. lots of ways to take this, but love to get your insight there before we... Before we uh, end the podcast yeah um so the way i thought about building the team was looking at the company's goals looking at what the company wanted to achieve um looking at the people that you have on the team currently what their skill set is then you map that to the level of guidance that they need and how much managerial help they need. Once you put that on a whiteboard, put that into a spreadsheet, you can start seeing um, where the gaps are. Um, so it's more like a gap analysis. So you start off by, you, you started as a strength analysis framework, um, but as you start building it out more and you're constantly looking at the objectives that you have to achieve for the company, it becomes, it, it transforms into a gap analysis. And then from there, I was able to say, well, if I get this person on first, this will move the needle on this objective. If I bring this person in second, it will move the needle on this objective. So I start building that out. And in the hires that I would list, I would say, this is the skill level that I want them to be at. So whether it was entry level, mid or senior, and what I would expect for, what I would expect from them in terms of the guidance that they would need from a manager, which would be me at that point in time. Um, so this is how I built it out. Um, and that is how the, the team grew. So we had events that came in first, but that person was a contractor. So I did a try before you buy with that person as well. And then product marketing came in after that, actually, no, wait, we had our uh, Marketo and our programs person. We didn't have Marketo yet, but we had our programs person and our marketing ops person, again, come in as a contractor after the events person and then the product marketer. Um, so it was all about where do you need momentum? Where can you make sure that things don't get stalled? Um, how do you need, how can you make sure that while you're keeping the things going, you also have to continue building out strategy. So keeping all this in mind, that's how people started trickling in and the recs got open. Marketing ops and marketing analytics is a really tough one because you're always in this dilemma of, well, do should I just keep um, building what we have and doing more programs and going after acquisition sources so that I can achieve what the business needs? Or should I bring in someone who is then assessing and monitoring and tracking everything that we are doing? Because then that feeds back into what we should do next. Mm -hmm. So do I need someone who can make that feedback loop stronger at this point? Or do I need someone who can just you know keep going and getting more of the you know traffic and you know accounts and leads, whatever you have in to hit the goals? Mm -hmm. So very tough dilemma. <laughs> what I did at Bugsnag was 
and it depends from company to company is our marketing analytics person has come in um, at, at this stage. The person joined us in April and not that we could not have brought in that person earlier, but again, they're conflicting demands that the business has. Mm -hmm. And so how do you keep all that in mind? Plus one thing that we, we really started focusing on, on Bugs at Bugsnag, um, and this came from our CEO was executive leverage. I can hire all these people in because I know that will help move the needle. But going back to your point earlier about total burnout, if I start having so many direct reports, it's just like, whew, and we can't that, we cannot let that happen either. So I need to stay sane and stable. And if that means pushing out a hire, so be it. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I guess sometimes if the, you think hiring more people is gonna help, but sometimes that mm -hmm. does, it can create more problems like you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I know we have to wrap it up because we're at 10 here, but we just want to say thank you very much for joining us. And I really think we should do this again because yeah. there's so many more avenues I want to pursue, so. even just to what we talked about today and others. <laughs> yeah, so, so many there. And even just double tapping on your experience as a mother, like, you know, I have so many questions on that. But I just want to say thank you so much, Kirti, for being on today and for all of our listeners who are listening to this and you enjoyed it please share with your colleagues and friends and we'll see you on the next episode of forward thinking have a good one